So here we are again, module six, security and safety. This is part one B. And in this section, we're gonna cover the second part of computer safety and health. We're gonna look at discovering the risks to physical, behavioral, and social health. We're gonna look at common cybersecurity attacks. So we'll look at the many ways that we need to protect ourselves and the kind of attacks that can come in to steal our data or impact our life by making our computers unproductive, et cetera. So first of all, I think it's important that we do spend time looking at physical health. We are on computers a lot. The majority of my day, especially as an IT instructor and an IT professional, I am at computers and I need to make sure that I'm ergonomically set and comfortable to use computers. And this includes my phone. You know, one thing I realized recently is that when I'm using my phone, because I want my arms to be down at my side, my neck is looking down all the time and I knew it was causing some neck pain. So now what I try to do is bring my arms up a little bit more, granted out of that sort of safe area, if you will, but compromise my neck because that's where my pain is, okay? A good thing to do, you know, is to think about the location of the monitor, as you see in this picture, the location of your elbows. Are they leaning against things? Currently, I am standing like this gentleman doing this presentation. Okay, I have three different positions that I can go in throughout my day. I can sit at a desk like this. I can be up higher in a chair where I'm sort of angled, uh, but still sitting. I tend to sit on the edge of the chair, or I can be fully standing like I am now. So when we talk about this, what we're talking about is repetitive strain in, uh, injury. Now, Here's my opinion. Back in the day, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was all about carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? And we heard a lot about that. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people that suffer from it. I know people who have legitimately suffered from it, but it seemed to be a pretty popular injury, if you will, carpal tunnel syndrome. We don't hear as much about it now, but we do think about repetitive strain injuries. So impacts the muscles and the nerves and the tendons. It makes us tired. It makes us ache. And we can do things to help ourselves. As you see, again, that person in the upper right sitting with her feet flat on the floor. You know, they could even be sitting on a balance ball, you know, to help with their core while they're sitting there working. Notice their arms are being supported and they're looking straight across at the monitor, not like that other picture that I showed you earlier. You know, suffer from Mari as I, you know, brought through using improper technique for sitting at a computer. So, you know, what's your back doing when it's sitting there? Is it at an angle? Is it being fully supported? You know, are you standing up? Are you changing positions? Are you going for walks? Are you stretching? You know, this leaves us into behavioral health and folks, the idea of technology addiction. When a user is obsessed with using a technology device and cannot walk away from it feeling extreme anxiety. Now, this also happens, by the way, when we talk about addiction to social media sites, addictions to gaming. It's not about addiction to your phone, really. It's about addiction to what you're looking at on your phone and you know recently studies are showing that tech companies are doing things to encourage you to spend more time on your phone now we do see you know as as the public perception changes we do see things like on my google phone now it has a little notification hey you have spent what you allotted as you know three percent of your day or a half an hour a day on social media sites I'm just letting you know that you've hit that. Maybe you want to stop and go do something else. I think it's important to be honest here. A few years ago, I got off of social media completely. It was my job. It is my job to teach these things. It's my job to interact with social media. However, what I found is I could come to the office. I could lose myself in social media and not be productive. Okay, still have an issue with, with YouTube, uh, frankly, but you know, I'll take a 10 minute break, I'll watch a video, I might watch videos at my lunch, but then I get right back to work. So I need that entertainment to shut off my brain just for a while, but I have to be careful because I can spend the whole day doing that if I allow myself to. This creates a sedimentary lifestyle, so too, 
too little of physical activities. I'm constantly going out, taking walks. When I'm on the phone with people, I go out and walk because I have the ability to be mobile while I'm on the phone. Psychological, so poor self-confidence, anxiety, depression. You know, we see this with uh, people, students who are being homeschooled. They don't get that life experience, the interaction with other people. You know, they tend to be internal uh, in nature, et cetera, and of course, interact on their phones. And, you know, although I've, I've given you some pictures here, I think it's important for you to understand what you're really seeing. You're seeing people standing next to each other who could be communicating interpersonally, could be creating a connection. They're all on their phones. And, and in fact, I've had students who are standing next to each other on their phones. I'm like, who are you texting? Who are you talking to? Oh, I'm talking to the person next to me. Well, why aren't you just doing that out? You know, why aren't you using your voice? That's the interaction. And of course, I'm sure you've all been in restaurants where you've seen families of four, you know, husband and wife, two kids, whatever the case may be. They're all on their phone from the moment they sit down, they stop, they order, and they're back on their phones. You know, what kind of life are you creating? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that's wrong. I'm just asking you to consider it. Social interaction, you know, fewer face-to-face -face interaction with others hinders social development, we're seeing that, causes social withdrawal because literally our society is in our hand, okay? Conservative estimates by worldwide organization, three to 4% of gamers struggling with addiction challenges. So there can be tens of thousands of addicted gamers today based on the number that are playing. Large scale study in Canada recently found 13% of students grades seven through 12 reported systems, symptoms of a video game problem. That's a 4% increase folks from 2007. And I also see this as it pertains to learning. You know, people spending so much time on social media, on gaming, on entertainment, that they don't get their work done. They end up dropping a class, taking it again, and instead of costing them maybe $500 for the class, the book, the technology, it now costs them a thousand because the next time they take it, there's a new book, whatever the case may be. So risk to social health. Most of you are aware with so cyberbullying. I won't spend a ton of time on cyberbullying. However, I think it's important to educate you again and to remind you of cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is an epidemic. And the reason it is, in my opinion, is because it's so easy to be anonymous, okay? Most people that are bullying wouldn't stand in front of you and shove you anymore, wouldn't bully you in person. But because it's so easy to be anonymous, it's easy to bully. So we see a lot of bullying there. We also see cyber stalking. So instead of somebody sitting out your house watching you, they're literally watching you through your digital footprint and you may be giving them the information to do it. You may be posting pictures that show you at the Starbucks and in your city in the downtown area. You may be posting things that, hey, next weekend I'm going to the coast and I'm gonna be at this portion of the coast and I plan on staying here. We are making it easy because of the data we're posting. So I really ask you to consider what you're posting and what you're telling people and should you be telling people this information in person versus over Facebook? Entirely up to you. I'm just giving you and educating you on the potential risks. Recent study, 18 to 29 year olds, uh, Rutgers University, 765 students involved in the study, 45% of stalkers were female and 56% were male. Now national figures show that to be an overwhelming margins saying 87% are male. I'm sure if we went out back and looked at statistics of regular stalking, stalking in person, it's probably not much difference. But rep, you know, men represented 40% of stalking victims in the Penn Rutgers study, 40% of males. So, you know, understand I'm not going to do this whole me too thing here. I'm just going to give you the information and let you decide. Are you a stalker or are you being stalked? And the fact is you may not even know. Okay. Now I don't mean to bring up fear, but I mean to make you aware to start looking at what you're posting and limit your risk to things like stalking, limit your risk to phishing, limit your risk 
to your data being stolen. And I'll give you more information on how to do that. Malware, so in order to understand how we're attacked, we need to understand what mechanisms are attacking us. And malware is simply malicious software programs used to infiltrate the victim's computers uh, without their knowledge, taking data from them, whatever the case may be. <laughs> now, one common target today is what's called phishing, and that's P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. And it's tricking users to perform compromising actions or providing sensitive data. As you saw before I showed you a phishing site, blokechain.com, where somebody had sent an email saying, hey, your account's been hacked, you need to go in, you need to change your username and password. Right now, for the next 24 hours, we'll allow you to use your old username and password, but after that, we're gonna close your account, and you're gonna have to go through all of this stuff to get back in. So what do people do? They jump out, they're scared, they're quick, they've been compelled, they've been fooled, they go to a website, it looks exactly like the website, they log in, bing, bang, boom, 30 seconds later, literally 30 seconds later, their account is emptied. So keep that in mind, make sure you're looking at those URLs, make sure you're mousing over links and emails and seeing where they're going. Are those trusted sites? And if you're still not sure, go out and Google it because people are now putting that information, oh, hey, this is a spear phishing site, this is a spear phishing scam. The difference between phishing is I'm trying to get a bunch of people hooked. Spear phishing is where I focus in on you, where I actually send an email as if I'm someone you know. Um, in our location in Central Oregon, a couple years ago, a, um, a local school district got hit where someone spearfished someone who had W-2 information and acted like they were someone higher up than that person who asked for literally them to be emailed every single person's W-2. And that was done and the W-2 information was released. What can I do with W-2 information? Well, I have your social security number. I know how much you make. Um, I can go out, I can research you, I can you know, get if if I see that you make a lot of money, you probably have good credit, and I can do what's called identity theft, which we'll talk about a little later. <laughs> All right, so common cyber attacks. Now that we know how we're gonna get attacked, let's break this down a little bit more. What we're looking at here as it pertains to attacks are viruses, which are basically malicious computer code that reproduces itself, you know, in some way <laughs> it gets on your computer. Folks, let me tell you that a lot of these things are interoperable. So when we talk about ransomware, we are talking about a virus, okay? We are talking about something that gets on your computer that either steals data, encrypts data, does something bad, okay? However, virus is a general term. Worm uses a computer network to replicate. So what it does is it gets on one computer and it says, ah, oh, this computer is connected to a network and that network hasn't been patched. Thus, I can actually take and reproduce the worm on that computer and that computer and that computer and see what happens. One example is the Melissa virus. And I would ask you to look up the old Melissa virus and see that it actually had a purpose, but oops, it wasn't used correctly the author didn't think about it. So look up Melissa. Uh, a Trojan malware that hides itself um, in another program. So you download a program that looks legit. It has a Trojan virus in it. It may be what malware that's tracking where you're going on the internet. It may be um, stealing your keystrokes. So if you think about it, if they see in your history, ah, they went out to US Bank and when they did that, they typed in that username and oh look there they typed in that password okay so you know those are called key loggers if i get a key logger on your machine it'll send the data out to somewhere on the web you might not even know it's happening now today we hear a lot about ransomware so i want to talk about this with ransomware what we're looking at is the idea of getting malicious code on our computer that encrypts our computer and the only way to get all of our data back is to pay the ransom. <laughs> now, let me be really clear. We're gonna talk about backups in a later section of this, of this chapter, of this module, sorry. If you're backing up your computer on a regular basis, you never need to pay the ransom. What you're gonna see and what I'm gonna demonstrate uh, when we talk more about ransomware is that people aren't, in fact, backing up their computers well. And what you see up here in the upper right 
is the largest known payout in ransom attack this year was by the city of Riviera Beach in Florida, according to Lingsa. Officials approved a $600,000 payment. So somebody did the risk and said, you know what? If we pay this and we might get our data back, and if not, it's gonna cost way more to lose our data or way more to restore and replicate our data, okay? So notice this is a 10-8-2019 article here. It's fairly recent especially for the class that's watching these video series ahead of time. So encrypting ransomware, again, it encrypts your computer. You gotta go out and get Bitcoin. The reason they have you get Bitcoin is because it's untraceable. Now, finally, there's the idea of social engineering. So let's take this away from the computer and let's focus on hacking the easiest thing to hack, which is people. And one of the reasons why it's easy to hack people is because we've been trained to give out information. We've been trained to be nice. We've been trained to be trusting. And unfortunately today, we have to limit or dial back that trust. Okay, so social engineering attacks that attempt to trick the victim into giving valuable information to an attacker. Now, of course, this can be done online through a phishing scam. It can also be done through a phone call. There's great examples. I would ask you to just go out and just uh, search social engineering attacks within YouTube. You'll find some great videos from CNN where one of their correspondents watched as someone took over their computer literally within seconds by making one phone call to a technical support company. So pretty interesting. Phishing, sending an email, um, and I can do this also in person. I can sit down with you at a coffee shop. Um, I can start a conversation. The way I get you to give me information is I give you all of mine. I tell you who my fake wife is, who my fake kids are, what my fake dog is, what my fake teams are. But because I'm sharing all this information, most people will relax and give me the same. And then I can be recording that and I now have some information to go attack them uh, socially to figure out what their usernames, passwords are, go search them on the web if they've given me their name and get even more information. A hoax is a false warning often contained in an email message. Great example was, about a decade ago, hoaxes were huge in emails. People would thought they were helping other people by sending out emails that said, by the way, be careful when the UPS driver comes to your door because terrorists have stolen 5,000 UPS uniforms. Blah, blah, blah. The problem is the biggest risk to most of those hoaxes was the time lost in productivity. And then of course there's spam unwanted emails where I try to get you to do something. I tell you that I'm a prince of a third world country and if you help me, you can have some of my money because I'm just a great guy and I've got to hide it from the government. <laughs> when we talk about uh, social engineering, one of, the, one of the, I guess you'd say, founders of social engineering was Kevin Mitnick. And if you're not familiar with Mr. Mitnick, he was actually wanted and did time for hacking, if you will, for social engineering. He uh, was involved with what's called the Blue Box, which was a tone dialer that you could buy and modify at uh, and build through Radio Shack that allowed you to put it on a payphone, make certain tones based on a code, and make unlimited long distance calls. So supposedly one of his friends in that was a guy named Steve Jobs. That's right, so Steve Jobs and Mitnick. Well, today Mitnick has turned around supposedly um, I think he's turned around. He's got this book called The Art of Deception. It's a great read on social engineering. Um, and he, of course, is one of the top consultants in the area. So definitely something to read, even if you get the audiobook. All right, so we're done with part 1B. We're going to move on to part 2A. That should say A, safeguarding computers and data in the first part, I'm gonna explain the steps to protect computer equipment, protect yourself, protect mobile devices, and definitely protect your privacy. I hope you'll come back and watch part 2A. Until then, take care and have a great day.